Thanks for sticking around for part two of The Grand Adventure by Olivier Bouchard. Now to tackle the central mechanic of the Minish Cap. In gameplay terms, it's not that far off the parallel world's dynamic of A Link to the Past. The game's world exists in two states, your perspective as a tiny Minish, or as the normal-sized Link. The actions that you take in one state impact the other, creating an interplay between the large and small versions of the world. Whereas A Link to the Past offered both a peaceful and twisted version of the same world, the Minish Cap doesn't change Hyrule so much as it invites you to examine it further, changing your point of view and putting everything into a new perspective. The game's main and only town is the perfect example of this. Everyday locations open up with endless mystery as you unlock more spots to shrink down to microscopic size. What was once a small and simple shoe store reveals a more complex story, a small self-contained quest waiting for you to journey on, a tiny adventure hidden in plain sight. And it absolutely does not stop there. By giving players the opportunity to take on diminutive sizes, the Minish Cap gives itself the chance to get gigantic. A specific scene has Link on top of a mountain, thunder rumbling and rain pouring on the young hero. It's all greatly evocative and reminiscent of A Link to the Past's opening. After your character shrinks down though, what was simply a weather condition becomes a real gauntlet. The rain droplets are now five times your character's size and can squash them if you aren't careful. The rain, used as a mood building tool first, is now a part of the gameplay. So while the world itself hasn't changed, its scope and implications sure do. The Minish Cap uses this particular trick quite a few times and it's always to great effect. In a really cute twist, some of the dungeon's bosses are simply regular enemies that you have to fight while shrunk down. Merely a trifle in your regular size, these enemies are Minish Cap's central combat challenges from a different perspective. One of the Minish Cap's game-long side quests culminates in Link meeting a giant Goron. The happy-looking creature is so massive that it can't fit on a single screen. So it's revealed progressively to the player, with only the tip of its head, already a few times bigger than Link, appearing at first. Not only is this a great way to convey scale, but the presence is also meant to add another layer to the game's use of perspective. Link is to the Goron what the Minish were to him. The giant, then proving to be sympathetic to Link, is indicative of a chain of life. Yes, the world of Minish Cap is small, but not only is it complex, it's part of a grander whole. At the end of the game, Link has seen the tiniest inhabitants of the world with the Minish, and also witnessed hints of what's beyond, where the towering giants live. While the adventure was constrained to this small piece of land, it implies that, of course, its impact will reach far beyond it and last longer than Link and Zelda's lifetime. Remember the all story I talked about in part one? What seems to be so attractive about this particular trope lies in how it paints a world with a history, the idea that people have lived here before. And what's been so disappointing about games that overuse this trope is that at their conclusion, they end up numbing that very sentiment. You're part of a chain of life rooted in repetition, the story you live through repeat again and again. Obviously, the idea of repetition is echoed through the Zelda franchise, and it's used to make new sequels that are supposed to fit into the same timeline. And Minish Cap is a part of this timeline, always repeating, but where it differs is that it implies your actions will have lasting power like those of the previous heroes of time. If an ancient civilization laid the foundation of what you're living through now, the actions of the hero of time will be what next civilizations are founded on. You are a part of the chain, but not only does the game imply that the world existed before you, but it also implies that it'll exist after you finish your adventure. From humble beginnings to hero of time. What the 2004 portable title does prove is that you do not need a big world to be a significant part of it. From the small scope at the beginning to its grandiose finale, Minish Cap has Link go through innumerable hardships, and this is exactly where the adventure lies. There is an almost childlike quality to its design, to the way Minish Cap transforms a small playground into a world with infinite challenges and possibilities. Compared to any other Zelda game, this is what made the Minish Cap feel unique and worthwhile. The Minish's world might be diminutive, but it holds a grand adventure. Thank you all so much for listening, for watching, for sharing our stuff. You're all amazing. Keep talking about games. They're the best. 